Jeff Robinson, welcome. Good to have you joining us. We really appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. Well, well let's just uh, go back here and establish who Jeff Robinson is. You were a defense attorney here in Seattle for quite a long time. You've been connected with the ACLU. Um, and you also have been giving these presentations about the history of racism in America, which then became this feature film. The idea of doing these presentations about the history of racism in America, where did that come from? I think it originally came uh, from circumstances <clears throat> in my family that led me to start reading about this history uh, in my 50s um, when a nephew became a son because his mom died and he lived in Queens and he moved to uh, Seattle to live with my wife and I. And having a young black man in your home as your son is very different from the concept of the dangers that exists for young black men in America today. And I got scared. I didn't have children at that point. And I started reading and part of what I started reading led me into things that I had never heard of before. And I've had one of the best educations in America. I went to Marquette University. I went to Harvard Law School and I was still finding things that I had never heard of before. And my training as a criminal defense lawyer always told me that if you have an incredibly complicated set of facts, put them into a timeline and see what it shows you. And when I started doing that, the picture that came out was astonishing. It was astonishing. Uh, Matt and I both have had the opportunity to watch a screener of the documentary. And uh, I find it literally mind blowing because what it tells me that America is really built on white supremacy and racism. It's a disturbing uh, uh, fact, and it's a fact that many people will want to dispute. And <clears throat> I think there are people who feel like it's either or. Either America had great politicians and great leaders who really believed in freedom or in democracy, or they were white supremacists who were horrible people and uh, there's nothing you know, to be lauded about them. And it's never either or when you're dealing with human beings. One of my favorite movies is Anatomy of a Murder and Jimmy Stewart plays a criminal defense lawyer in that movie. And at one point he says to someone, you know, as a lawyer, I've had to learn, people aren't just one thing. And I learned that as a criminal defense lawyer in Seattle person could be an incredibly loving father, an incredibly loyal friend, and somebody that sells drugs. A person could be an incredibly uh, brilliant person at any number of things, and also somebody that commits an act that's defined as a crime. People aren't just one thing. And everybody listening to this knows that because <laughs> all of us have been saints or sinners at some point. And so if countries are made up of people, then countries aren't just one thing either. It's not either or. Uh, uh, the quick example that I'll give you is that, uh, and maybe we can talk more about this 1776 report that came out from the Trump administration. But one of the things they say in there is that James Madison was so against slavery that he made sure that the word slave didn't appear in the Constitution because he didn't want it to be read to approve of the ownership of human beings. And there's no question that Madison said something like that. But the Constitution doubled down on the institution of slavery. And instead of the word slave in Article 4 of the Constitution, what it says is anyone held to service or labor must be returned to their owner immediately. 
And so the concept of slavery was in the Constitution. And when when Patrick Henry, remember him, give me liberty or give me death? Oh, yeah. When Patrick oh, yeah. Henry wrote to the Virginia Constitutional Convention, because all these people were writing to each other about, are we gonna sign this constitution? And Patrick Henry was worried about whether enslaved people would be emancipated. And what James Madison wrote about that was, he said that paper, he says, there is no power to warrant it, emancipation, in that paper, meaning the Constitution. If there be, I know it not. So James Madison may have had really, really complicated feelings about slavery. He may have been against it, but he doubled down on it in the Constitution. And so that just shows that people aren't just one thing. Yeah. You know, watching the movie, I, 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 I was thinking like people of color are going to watch this and go, yeah, I get this. I understand it. What do white people think? I mean, they got to fall into different camps, but generally, what do they think when they see this and hear this? I think the reaction from most of the white people that have seen this has been a reaction of shock. And I think it is, I think it's important that you recognize that if you're asking people to discard part of the narrative of their country, part of the narrative of their history, part of their own history. If you are asking them to look at that and say, that narrative is not true, you're asking a lot. Yeah. And, and so it is, people get shocked and people, oh my God, what is this? And I'm not saying we have to wait for white people to get comfortable with anything. I'm just saying the reaction that most of the people that have seen this presentation uh, have had most of the white people has been shock. I mean, there's some people who know the history, but, and, and, uh, you know, as I make clear, I learned a lot of this history in my fifties. So I'm not trying to prove to anybody I'm smarter than you. What I'm trying to demonstrate is how we are taught the legend of America and not the fact of America. And we shouldn't be afraid of the facts because America is still a great country. But that greatness does not erase the depravity of the institution of slavery and what came after that. And that's what I, mean, I, I want people to understand as we are doing this podcast with you, uh, that this film is about facts, really, and the presentation that you lay out. Uh, I know that it is part of a, a what about three-hour presentation you normally do, but you get into the deep facts of the creation of the country to the founding fathers, to all of these things that we, that this country has um, had and uh, explaining the issue of how race is so much of in our fabric here that you can't deny the existence of racism or the existence of white supremacy because you're laying out facts. And that's what blows me away. When you look at what was going on in colonial America and the absolute horrific white supremacy and racism that was rampant throughout the 13 colonies, and then you understand that at the Constitutional Convention, the issue of slavery was on the table. That's another favorite of the 1776 report. They say that America didn't exist until July 4th, 1776. So anything that happened before that, excuse me, anything that happened before that was, uh, that was the British. And uh, <laughs> there is, you know, there is the thought of, so the white supremacy and the money and the racism that existed in the American colonies on July 3rd, 1776, just got wiped away because we changed our name on July 4th, 1776, from American colonies to American country. And then when you consider what happened at the Constitution, people doubled down because the institution of slavery was on the table being discussed. And the ways 
in the Constitution that advantages were given to slave owners and that the institution of slavery was protected demonstrate exactly, you know, if the facts show what they show. America doubled down on the institution of slavery. Yeah. And as I was reading stuff and, and doing this initial research, um, I'm a person that uh, uh, lyrics from songs and uh, things that other people have written stick in my mind. And there was a great band in the 70s called Steely Dan. Mm -hmm. And they wrote a song called The Caves of Altamira. And the hook to that song was before the fall when they wrote it on the wall, when there wasn't even any Hollywood. They heard the call and they wrote it on the wall. For you and me, we understood. And they're talking about cave drawings in Altamira, France that are 20,000 years old. And most historians agree that the Sumerians were one of the first cultures to use written language. And that was about 5,000 years ago. And so what is demonstrated there when you look at those cave drawings and you see the pictures and the stories that are told in those cave drawings and the stories about how to hunt the animals that sustained the people that were living there and these drawings could then give that information to the next generation and the next generation. When human beings even in the most primitive form. So this goes back to the origin of the human species. This is a racial trait that is implicated throughout all of humanity. When I say racial, I mean human race. When we think we're doing something important, we write stuff down. And if you wanna know what colonial Americans thought, you can go to the historical societies of every state that was a colony. And they've got documents going back to the 1600s telling you exactly what Americans thought about the institution of slavery and white supremacy. When we were debating the constitution, people were writing letters, Patrick Henry, James Madison, George Mason, the founding fathers were writing each other and saying exactly what they thought about the institution of slavery. And so we can just go back and look at original source documents. When you look at the original handwritten uh, Star Spangled Banner by Francis Scott Key, and you see the words in the third verse in his handwriting, celebrating the murder of enslaved people. It's these kind of facts that to me says, and again, this is my training as a lawyer, you don't wanna tell people what to think. You just put the facts there and let people draw their own conclusions. And these facts are damning, quite frankly. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I found really interesting was when you looked at the gross national product <laughs> at that time, what percentage of the economy was based on slavery was stunning because that's something people just don't understand. And that really tells you how ingrained it was in the, in well, the country. It, 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 it tells you something. It really does. Because when you consider that uh, there were about 700,000 enslaved people in America in 1790, and between 1790 and 1860, that grew to 4 million. And remember, this is after the uh, uh, inter international slave trade was essentially, uh, well, was significantly reduced after 1808. So a lot of this was done by breeding human beings. And so I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, and there was a brand of uh, food like, you know, bacon, sausage, that kind of stuff called King Cotton. And, you know, King Cotton, that was just a phrase that I grew up with my entire lifetime and I recognized it. And as I was doing this reading back, you know, 10 years ago, I came across that phrase and I had all these memories that were nostalgic about, you know, my childhood. And then I understood where it came from. And this was a phrase that was coined by one of the politicians in the South who was basically saying, the North wants to mess with us, we'll just cut off the cotton. 
See what happens to their mills in the north. We will shut them down in days and we'll stop shipping it to Europe. See how quickly uh, England and France come to our defense. Cotton is king and a war with King Cotton is a war you're going to lose. Now that's paraphrasing, but the exact quote is there in history. That's where the phrase King Cotton came from. And, and, and another thing that I think is significant, many people see that there were, if you look at, I think it's the 1860 census, there were about 3.94 million enslaved people in America. Many people say that's the number of people that America enslaved. That's the number of enslaved people that were alive in 1860. So the number of people America enslaved goes way beyond that because that institution started in 1619. Wow. There so, was also oh, the, the presentation. You went to a, a place where you talked with a fellow who, who really gives you the background of how they prepared people to be sold as slaves. And it, and it was really almost like someone that was going to be selling a home in a way. Uh, you know how you get your home ready and you have somebody come in to dress everything up. Well, it was the exact same thing they did with, with slaves. It blew me away to listen to how, you know, basically they groomed them. They then also put out the, the Slave Mart Museum. It was in uh, Charleston, South in Charleston, Carolina. South Carolina. Yeah, right. and... and we're talking about people. Yes. And, and it was like a, it, they were commodities. They were commodities. And it's interesting because <clears throat> um, another part of the documentary shows a discussion that I had with a man named, uh, I think it was Braxton Spivey, who is a man who was holding a Confederate flag down right. at the waterfront in South Carolina. And at one point when he said, um, uh, and again, you know, my training as a lawyer is helpful in these uh, situations, but he didn't want to talk about uh, how much uh, the labor of enslaved people contributed to uh, the economy. He wanted to say the war wasn't about slavery, it was about something else. And when we started getting into the facts there, he switches and he switches topics and says, well, we treated people like family and or at least enslaved people were treated like family back then. And he said that that was on a Sunday and that previous day we had been in the Slave Mart Museum and heard about how people, we saw the shackles that were made for three-year-olds. We saw whips that were uh, interlaced with nail heads in order to tear the skin we saw all kinds of depravity, quite frankly. And then to hear this man try and paint that as uh, they were treated as family. And then quite frankly, to hear this week that a politician, uh, I can't remember if it was Florida or Louisiana, is saying we have to teach the good side of slavery <laughs> because, because uh, slave owners sometimes loved their slaves and their slaves loved the slave owners and everything was fine. And so, you know, it's understanding that this narrative, all of these little narratives, this isn't something that it's all long ago and we're past that. It's in prime existence right now in America. Well, that's it because Enrique had, you know, had said that this, your presentation is all about facts, but we're living in a country where it doesn't seem that facts matter to people. I mean, where are we with that? I mean, a lot of this I'd lay on the media because that's what they highlight. I, it would break my heart to believe that the majority of whites in this country believe this nonsense, you know, but who we highlight seems to, I mean, that feeds into the narrative of conflict. You know, everything's a horse race. And it does a disservice to our real history. It does a disservice to the facts. I mean, how do you feel? I mean, can you convince people with your presentation? Do you think it moves people? <clears throat> I guess we'll find out, won't we? <laughs> and I hope uh, so. so that's one answer. And the other answer, I guess there's three answers. The second answer is I can guarantee you that people's minds will not be changed 
if this kind of information isn't put out there. Right. I yes. can promise you that. Right. And so third, has this impacted people? I can tell you I've been giving versions of this presentation for a long time and people have been impacted. People have changed their behaviors. People have gotten involved in organizations that they weren't involved in before. And so I believe that this information is so powerful and so <clears throat> verifiable. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to tell people, don't believe me. Uh, you can go and find the exact same thing. And so, you know, my dream would be to debate someone uh, on who, who from the who wrote the 1776 report, for example, and I'll say right now, I will debate them right now. Any uh, name the arena, and here are the rules. But they're rules that will be enforced, not like the presidential and vice presidential debates. It's like one person talks at a time. And you talk on the topic of the question that's asked. And if you start going off on a tangent, it's like, no, 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 come back here. You're not going to do that. We're going to answer this question before we go anywhere else. I will debate one of them anytime, anywhere, because their facts are either flawed or they are incomplete. And so, uh, you know, did, did James, did, uh, did Thomas Jefferson say right before he died, oh my, you know, I'm very concerned because I know there's a God and, and, and you know, he may not approve of what we've done like with the institution of slavery. Did he have those regrets right before he died? I'm sure he did. But that doesn't excuse what he did <laughs> during his life. It doesn't change what he did. I'm glad if he had those regrets, but it doesn't change who he was and what he lived and what he supported. And so I think I understand why many Americans are so terrified of, oh my God, if we admit that this is the true history, what comes next? And for me, there are two things people are afraid of. Well, my gosh, if this gets turned around, are they going to do to us what we did to them? That's number yeah. one. And number two is, oh, my God. Does this mean that this, you know, yes, I've been hardworking. Yes, I have like had my own struggles as a white American, you know, but I've worked through all this stuff and I've gained what I've gained. And does this mean that it wasn't an even playing field? Because if it means that, does it mean we've got to do something about it? Can you say well, reparations? I, you know, yeah, which, is, the, which, which is interesting because reparations have already been paid, as you point it's, out. It's an amazing, amazing the, concept. Reparations were paid during, after the Civil War, and it was... Well, right um, in the middle of it. Right well, in the middle. Of it. Well, Abraham Lincoln saw that the, uh, right. the former slave owner, owners in, in the South got money. So that they could then go back and rebuild. He wanted the he, he as he was pondering the Emancipation Proclamation, he was worried about the slave owners in, in the D.C. area and wanted them to be loyal to the Union. And so he ended up paying them one million dollars in 1862 money. And I think that's one of the other things that there are terms that we use in American culture, like the term affirmative action. If I say affirmative action, most Americans think those are programs of uplift in the 60s and 70s, where there are programs to give blacks some advantages and the Supreme Court at some point decided that, it, that they could go too far and that's reverse discrimination. And we're kind of somewhere in between right now in terms of affirmative action. Affirmative action didn't start in the 60s. Can you think of a more powerful form of affirmative action than giving one race of people the right to own another race of people. And then after the, the uh, Compensated Emancipation Act, which was the act that provided that $1 million of reparations to white slave owners whose enslaved people were being freed, 
that same year, he passed the Homestead Act. And that's one of the things that the, the film makes clear about what the Homestead Act did for white Americans for literally a few dollars. You had 160 acres of land, in some instances more. And if you lived on it for five years, it was yours. And white Americans got 80 million acres of land by 1900 under the Homestead Act. And Dr. King, about a year before he died, gave a speech, uh, a sermon really, where he was talking about the Homestead Act gave them the land, the government built land grant colleges with government money, they paid for county agents, they gave them low interest rates to mechanize their farms. They paid them subsidies not to farm. And then he said, and these are the people telling black Americans to lift yourself by your own bootstraps. So Amazing. affirmative action has always been part of the government when it comes to white Americans. And what's wrong with the government taking affirmative steps to improve the economic economic status of the people that live in the country. It's kind of like, that sounds like a good idea. Well, they're doing so it that, right now. They're doing, yeah. it's happening right now. Yes, right yeah. now. So yeah. the history yeah. puts these things into context. And I think, I think that part of the reason we have taken two steps forward and three steps backward is that we do things like we pass an anti-choking law and think that's going to stop police violence in black communities. Because it's not past that law and that will solve the problem. The problem isn't there isn't a law against choking people. The problem is the relationship between police and the black community that goes back to the formation of this country. And if we don't understand that in legislation that we're putting forward now, we will get the same results that we've gotten for the last hundred years. Enrique, that's something that many people, we didn't go into it in detail in the film. 1919 in Chicago, black people are killed and there's a commission report. 1935 in Harlem, same thing. 1967 in Detroit, same thing. 1992 in LA, same thing. From 1919 to 1992, these commission reports are being written and they all say exactly the same thing. They talk about the racism in law enforcement. They all say exactly the same thing. So until we reckon with that history, we are not going to address these issues in a way that really moves us forward. Well, also we have law enforcement, if you look back in that country's history is connected to the slave trade and the enforcement there. I mean, it's, so it's, it's really frightening. Um, I think that the earliest that we could find, I think is 1704 or 1705 in South Carolina, but that's the, the institution of slave patrols. Uh, right. But article four of the constitution says that any person held to service or labor, because they didn't want to use the term slave, any person held to service or labor, meaning an enslaved person, has to be delivered up on demand. That means that if you escaped, you had to be returned to your owner. The law was, and so anybody enforcing the law, as soon as there were law enforcement people, they were enforcing that. The Constitution, the document that formed this country, made Black attempts at freedom unconstitutional. And so when you wonder, why is there such this divide between police departments and Black communities all over America? It goes back to the formation of this country. Law enforcement has always, from the formation of this country, had as one of its responsibilities, one of the responsibilities given to it, not that they asked for, one of the responsibilities given to law enforcement, go in and control these Black communities. First, it was keep them enslaved. And then after the Civil War, it was enforce all these Black codes and Jim Crow laws and, and on and on. And so the jobs that we have given law enforcement, the narratives that we have given law enforcement about Black people in America, all these things have a consequence and they have led us to where we are today. And, 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 and people get insulted 
when you say there's a problem with law enforcement in the black community. Vice President Pence says, I'm insulted that you would say there's even implicit bias. Uh, uh, even Vice President Kamala Harris, you know, she recently said, no, America isn't a racist country. And it's this, this refusal to acknowledge, no pun intended, who we are. It's this refusal to acknowledge that that has us taking two steps forward and three steps backward. And until we reckon with it out in the open, until we have what William Burroughs the uh, off beat generation author called a naked lunch moment with white supremacy and racism in America, it ain't gonna get better. And Burroughs said a naked lunch moment is that moment when everyone has to look at what is really on the end of their fork. You know what? Do that with our history, it's gonna have an impact. You know who really needs to watch this is younger people. Yeah, because they're out there in support of Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And I don't think a lot of them see the injustice, the inequity, but they don't know the history. Matt, if, you they are watch so... the, if they watch this, they will know the reason they're there. You are so right. And so there are a couple of things there. The documentary film is the first asset of the Who We Are project. I was a deputy legal director at the National ACLU and the director of the Trome Center for Justice and Equality, which housed all of their criminal legal system work and racial justice work. That was my job until March 31st of this year. And I, I loved that job. I left that job to start the Who We Are Project because education about the truth about our history is critical. And I'll, I'll give you, and so let me say two things. Number one, the Who We Are Project is attacking this issue of correcting the narrative about white supremacy and anti-Black racism in America and having a major impact in the next five years. You'll notice that the film title is A Chronicle of Racism in America, not The Chronicle of Racism in America, because The Chronicle would include so many other groups that have experienced racism and discrimination in America. I don't have the capacity to tell that story, but as a Black American, I can tell part of our story. So this is a chronicle of and, racism. And your own story, because you go back to your own home. and your own Well, and, and, and so, and, and the Who We Are Project is going to uh, address this education in three buckets. One is schools, one is co the community at large, and one is government offices and corporations. And Matt, when you said that, I wanted to refer you back because in 1837, John C. Calhoun, one of the most virulent racists in American history, was talking about the spirit of abolition that was creeping into the minds of what he called the rising generation. That exact phrase, the rising generation, is used in the 1776 report that the Trump administration put out three days before they left office on, on a Monday when America was celebrating Martin Luther King. And they've got pictures of Dr. King in the report and some of his quotes in the report. But again, uh, talk about selecting, being selective. So this issue of education is absolutely critical. And my point is that back in 1837, people understood if you educate the rising generation about the truth about abolition and what slavery really is, there's slavery has no chance. And if we educate the rising generation now about how about why 2021 looks the way it does, then they are going to make different decisions than the ones that we have made. And there are a lot of people that are deathly afraid of that. So one of the things we're doing is working to create a study guide that would go along with this film. And we are definitely going to be looking to get this film into schools as part of a curriculum. And we will be looking to develop a curriculum that teaches this kind of history even more broadly. So I think the, the whole purpose that we started the Who We Are Project is the feeling that, especially right now, uh, 
America is at a tipping point. And which way we go this time is going to be critically important. And we've been at these tipping points before, and we've always rolled back. So I felt like if there was ever a time to put all of my effort into making sure that the rising generation understands the truth about our country, that we are a great country and a racist country, and that the older generations in America can start to understand that truth so that we can start to undo some of the things that we did. Um, I felt like this was the time to, to make that move. It's great timing. There's no doubt about that. I, can we talk briefly uh, about uh, the filmmakers involved with you on this? Because uh, it, it really sort of, it was serendipity, I guess, because uh, Tell me about the filmmakers and how they ended up connecting with you. I was giving one of the presentations on the history of racism in America in, uh, to a group of federal lawyers and judges in New York City. And one of the lawyers in the room was a woman named Sarah Kunstler. She is one of the daughters of William Kunstler, the civil rights lawyer who was one of the counsel at the trial of the Chicago Seven. And that's one of the things he did. He did a myriad of other things. Yeah. But she and her sister, Emily, uh, have made films. And she, you know, you say, can this kind of information impact someone? Sarah, as she would tell you, grew up in an anti-racist family, a family where they talked about uh, racism and talked about an obligation to do something about it, not just an obligation not to participate in it. But she hadn't heard these facts and it impacted her in a significant way. And she and her sister, Emily, uh, asked to have coffee with me at a Starbucks in downtown Manhattan. And I don't drink coffee, so I had hot chocolate. And they said, let's make a movie. And I laughed and I thought that's the silliest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> I was impressed and I was, you know, I think I thought, thank you so much. I'm glad you liked the talk, but uh, that was April of 2017. And on Juneteenth of 2018, we were in Town Hall Theater in New York City, which is on Broadway in front of a packed house. And we filmed the presentation with seven cameras. And for the next three years, as I would go around the country giving this presentation, we would travel in a 15 person van because it was me and uh, Andrea Crabtree, who was has been my paralegal, my executive assistant at the ACLU and now the director of operations at the Who We Are project. She keeps you in she, line. She, well, <laughs> she is a, a valuable, a valuable co-conspirator. And it would be Sarah and Emily and me and Andrea and Jesse Wakeman, one of our camera people. And sometimes uh, my wife would go and sometimes one of Sarah's sisters would go and we'd have a couple of other people and we would drive around and interview people whose lives reflected the facts that we were bringing out in the presentation. So it's one thing to talk about the number of people who were lynched. It's another to go to Lowndes County, Alabama and talk to Josephine Bowling McCall and hear her tell the story of how her father was lynched in 1947. We can show uh, uh, footage that we found, archival footage that we found in a Fox movie tone file um, of what happened after the Tulsa massacre in 1921. So there is footage of the city literally burning and being in, and in destruction. Um, but we were also fortunate enough to talk to a woman named Lessie Benningfield Randall, who's 106 years old and who survived the massacre and who has memories of the massacre. And some of the things she said, you know, it brought the hair on the back of my neck to stand up. Um, so we wanted, to, we wanted to tell the stories of people whose lives reflected the course of American history in terms of white supremacy and anti-Black racism and that's how the movie came together. I never intended to make a movie. That wasn't my purpose. This presentation was to help 
myself and other criminal defense lawyers confront racism in the criminal legal system. It then became broader because I felt like more people in the community should understand this, not just people in the criminal legal system. And I was minding my own business, doing this as kind of a second job and meeting Sarah and Emily was, uh, it was serendipitous, but it was uh, incredibly fortunate. They are brilliant, brilliant filmmakers. Is this your life's work now? This is the work that I plan on doing going forward. And uh, every job I've had, I always thought would be the last job I would ever have. When I came out of law school and I was a Seattle King County public defender, I thought that was the last job I'd ever have. I did that for five years. And then I was a federal public defender. And I thought that would be the last one. And then I went to Schrader, Goldmark, and Bender. And I was there for 27 years. And I didn't plan on going to the ACLU. And I didn't plan on starting the Who We Are project. What I will say is this. The work I was doing at the ACLU and the National ACLU is launching a systemic equality program that is robust and fantastic. And my ability to have a role in shaping that program was something that was really important to me, but this was more important. And so this is what I will be doing for the balance of my career, unless something more important comes up. And quite frankly, given, you know, I, my career has been 40 years long. At this point, I can't imagine anything more important than this. I agree. Unbelievable. I agree. I, I want you to know that I think uh, this piece is so important. I hope it is uh, eventually available for people throughout the country to see, for young people in schools to see, in the college level. Uh, Thank you so and I, much. And I really hope that the Oscars, the Academy Awards take <laughs> close. I'm serious. Oh, yeah. I think this is this this is a something that has to be honored, but also seen so much. Because, I didn't especially think, in this time. In this yes. time, yeah. I I didn't realize. Uh, I knew that Sarah and Emily were incredibly talented women, and that they were skilled at their profession. I didn't realize what they would do with the presentation, with the interviews of the people that we talked to. And the way they put this together was remarkable. And I will, I will always have a, a special place in my heart for them because uh, I could not have done this without them. And let me just say one other thing about them. Many people have been amazed at the way this movie was made because all documentaries are made kind of as labors of love and people are contributing their work and their services, but I own this movie 100%. Sarah and Emily don't own any of it. They were paid for work that they did, but they don't own any of it. This was their idea. I didn't have any movie experience, but they understood the importance of this film and they understood the importance of the work of the Who We Are project. And so they wanted me to have 100% ownership of the film so that when we sell this film, 100% of the sales price and the future earnings are going to the Who We Are project so that we can hire the people to make sure that we can, as you kind of said, Enrique, getting this in front of as many eyes as possible. We've got those three buckets and we are gonna be pushing really hard in all three, schools, community, government, and corporate offices. We will be pushing really hard in all three, not just to get this film there, not just to get this information there, but to then work with people on that next step, which is, okay, now that you know this, what are you going to do about it? Right. Well, uh, Matt and I will be there to help you. Uh, Thank you so carry much. Carry the word on because you bet. I think, you know, we're in the age range, folks, here, and we're at the time in our life, um, you know, we've, we've lived through being the first in our business and experiencing oh. the racism there. And, and all of this, uh, I, 
I want to see change. And I really think that this could help spark this change that's much needed. Um, Enrique, just as you, you said that, I'm, I'm looking at, it's like at you, at Matt, at me, all of us have been the first fill in the blank right. at <laughs> some point in our career. And we've been it more than once. That is and true. I used to feel like that's, uh, I used to feel like that was not an accomplishment. I don't have the right word, but as opposed to something positive, it's just like, it's, 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 it's a burden. It's old. It's like, you know, we've got to be, you know, we've got to get to the point where there is no comment about, oh, I'm the first one or I'm this or that because, and, and that's where I think, uh, that's why I think the work that I'm doing now will take me to uh, the end of what I will call my useful career. Um, <laughs> I don't know how many years I have in front of me, but I know they're probably fewer than the 40 years I have behind me. And I'm turning 65 in August. What I'm looking to do for the rest of my career is to make a major impact on the way we deal, on the way we reckon with our racial history. And I really don't think there's anything that's gonna pull me away from that. Yeah. Well. You're getting there. You're doing it, and uh, we we can help you spread the word. And uh, I appreciate we'll do what being we can. on this podcast Be because you're you're so you're a little bit younger than us. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, Jeffrey. Absolutely. The best.